Welcome everyone. Recording? Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, it is. Uh, I am consenting. Yes, so welcome everyone to this research day for in uh, quantitative life science. So we'll have a, a lot of great talks um, lined up uh, from our students. But um, I would say, so you see here um, a shared slide. Um, I would say uh, right from the beginning, that's so self-organization, just that word is one of the core motivation and rationale for having a PhD program in quantitative life science in the first place, right? So work studying from the molecule to whole ecosystems. So we're re very fortunate um, today to have one of its major contributor, Corina Ternita, to, uh, to share her insights, her insights with us. Um, so Corina is uh, on the faculty at, at Princeton University in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. And so she joined the faculty in 2013. Uh, I would say the timeline here is very condensed because things seem to have happened really fast. Um, I, if, I, if I scale that to my own career, I would have to multiply by at least two um, the, the, time, the time frame for this. But so before joining um, the faculty at Princeton, uh, Corina has a, as a math prodigy, uh, as a young teenager, just had, was... Uh, at the door of Harvard open for her in math. So she did an undergrad in, in mathematics at Harvard. And see, she started a PhD program in, in mathematics. And, and, and then something happened, I would say, so I would ask you if it was the right move after her talk, you can, you can decide if it was the right move. She was still, I guess, hooked on uh, the pure math high uh, at, at Harvard. Uh, and with the promise of well-paid jobs and, and banks, um, when she read the book of, on evolutionary dynamics by Martin Nowak and decided to work on termites instead um, and, and social insects. So you'll, you'll tell me if it was the, the right move. Uh, sorry, I, I read his book way too late to make that kind of move for me. It didn't have that impact. Uh, but she continued her PhD with Martin Nowak um, in evolutionary biology, published a... Uh, now, uh, very important papers in Nature with E.O. Wilson, Mark Nowak on the evolution of social insects. Um, and that followed a, a, um, a fellowship at Harvard. She was a Harvard fellow uh, just before joining uh, the faculty at Princeton. She uh, holds um, a number of awards, many awards, and she's uh, part of this. She's early career fellow from the Ecological Society of America. And she's also a fellow the, uh, for the Kivli Frontiers of Science fellow at the National Academy of Science. And so it will be great to hear her talk on self-organization and over to you, Carita. Thank you so much, Fred, for inviting me and for this extremely kind um, introduction. Yeah, I'm very happy to talk about these like serendipitous, various serendipitous events. Um, I certainly, my career did not have a linear path. If you had asked me in my early twenties, what I would be, this would not have been an answer. I, would, I didn't even know that this existed. Um, Biology to me at the time was just a long, long, long list of memorizing plant parts and, and animal parts, and ah, uh, that did not that did not work. Um, so anyway, but I'm certainly I I yeah I can come back to it, but I'm I'm certainly very glad that uh, somehow I ended up um, learning uh, about biology from a quantitative perspective, and so. Um, I have to confess from the beginning that uh, my quest in biology has been very much about uh, just following curiosity. But as I was going up for tenure and people were asking me, you know, what is, what is it that you do? What is the actual, you know, what's the overarching umbrella? I started to think about, well, is there an, actually a thread through all of the things that I'm thinking about? And the thread it, it actually appeared to be quite naturally one of self-organizations. How, how are systems... Uh, you know, complex systems, how do they organize themselves? And um, at, what, at what scale, you know, at what spatial scale, at what temporal scale can we, uh, do we need to look at these systems to get some inroad into that complexity, to try to understand how these rather smaller scale interactions um, can lead to um, emergent patterns at a global scale. And then also, of course, another really important question is, what makes these systems robust? And so um, one of the, uh, I, I uh, take a comparative approach and we look at um, across spatial temporal scales, we look from the origin of multicellularity and social behaviors all the way to the organization of human systems. Uh, actually, this is, this is a more recent one um, and, and the organization of, of communities and ecosystems. 
So, um, and, 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 and as I said, in general, uh, basically it's this idea of small scale interactions and, 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 and studying their emergent patterns and properties. So I decided to split, uh, split the talk. I decided to, make, to, to give the talk as a kind of a survey of the different kinds of problems that we've worked most recently, let's say in the last two years, I think I've focused on um, and, and, um, and, and split it into two parts. One is, that primarily focuses on evolutionary timescales. And we ask questions about the origin of biological construction. And then one that is on more ecological timescales and when we talk about pattern formation. So when I think about biological construction, um, there are two primary modes. So, so um, whether we think about um, multicellular organisms or, or animal societies, there are two main um, there are two main uh, modes by which nature constructs new complexes, hierarchical complexes, takes units that are otherwise the same or, or very similar, puts them together and creates something new, right? Cells into multicellular organisms, uh, animals into animal societies. And those two operations are either uh, what we call staying together or what's also known as um, as clonal development if you think of it in terms of multicellularity um, so that starts with one cell when it divides the daughter doesn't separate um, and and so you start building these let's say chains um, but you could build other geometries as well um, but in principle the whole process starts from one daughter from, from from one mother and her daughters whether they are daughter cells or whether it's an ant uh, building its own um, colony, a, a colony of ants always starts from one queen and her daughters that stay at the nest. At the same time, there's also a mode called coming together or aggregative construction, where um, whereby you take individuals that are otherwise independent, but for some reason at some point in their lifetime, they need to come together and form a society possibly because of some external threat of predation, of starvation, whatever it is, but they are otherwise independent individuals and they need to come together, aggregate and form um, a, a, a new complex, a new group. So these are two very, very simple operations. That, yet these are the operations that have been used over and over and over. And the interesting thing about it is that it's tantalizing mathematically. They're it's, it's really nice and elegant that there are two very simple operations and some maybe, uh, you know, mixes of them. They, sometimes you can have a staying together uh, or, or a coming together uh, kind of society where individuals also reproduce within the group. So you might have some elements of staying together. So you can also combine these um, a little bit. But um, in principle, they're very simple operations. And so on the one hand, that's exciting. On the other hand, if you think about it, then it becomes kind of hard to explain how on earth from these very simple operations did nature build so much complexity, so much diversity, and, 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 and what exactly makes these new constructs robust? And, and, and often when we think about, and, and I put complexity in quotations there because um, there's an endless number of definitions of, of, of what complexity is. And I think all I wanna say by that is how do you get anything interesting happening inside that group of, let's say, you know, five or 10 ants that are otherwise, you know, very similar, they're sisters, they, they are able to do only the same thing. So how do you get anything more interesting than that? How do you get division of labor? How do you get cell differentiation and so on? So um, typically the answers have been, you know, whenever we think about how do you build things that are more complicated or more diverse, the answers have been sought in the form of, well, you know, things have to change and then evolution and, and this and that. And, and of course, evolution is an extremely powerful process and ecological context and so on. And so you can get all of these many things to, you can explain many things by that process. But we are trying to understand how much of this can actually arise almost for free when the constructs are built. So we are primarily interested in the very origin of biological construction and not so much, you know, I don't know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years after or millions of years after as evolution will have shaped these complexes under changing uh, conditions and so on. So um, I want to give examples of each one of these. I'll try to make it 
uh, relatively quick, but I am very, very happy to go in, in detail about any one of them at the end. So I have more slides. If you have questions, I'm very happy to go into detail about any of these. But so I'll start with this question of complexity and emergent properties, basically. If you put together units that are the same, can you get a, a, a very much right there just by throwing in individuals that are otherwise very similar? Um, can you get something interesting happening out of that? Is there any synergy possible at this early onset of group formation? And so this story actually starts quite some time ago, and this is the paper that, that Fred mentioned, but let me tell you a little bit about insect sociality first. So um, the way, that, so, so um, ants are considered eusocial, um, as are some species of wasps and bees um, and termites. And um, that means um, that they, in their groups, so, so they have this very interesting organization. They start, um, the ants in particular, they start with a reproductive queen. Um, she lays the first batch of eggs by herself. This is the start of any colony, even the most advanced colonies that have millions and millions of individuals like the leafcutter ants still start with one queen that has to lay her first eggs, has to take care of them, Eventually, out of those eggs, some daughters will arise. There are two types of daughters. One set of daughters um, have wings and resemble the mom, and they are going to be the virgin queens that eventually, when they mature, they fly away, they mate, and they, um, and they create, um, and they start their own colonies. Um, the other type of daughters are uh, daughters that stay at the colony, they're workers, they tend to the mother and to her eggs, and they basically help their mom raise more offspring. Um, and, and these are the males waiting for the virgin queens in a nuptial flight. The males don't do very much in these colonies, they are purely uh, for, uh, used for mating purposes and they die after mating. So, um, the interesting thing, why, why this is such a special type of social behavior is because, and, and, and E.O. Wilson termed it eusocial, is because um, you have this division of reproduction. It's not that they have, I mean, they have a lot of sophisticated things going on, but the most important thing is, is, is a division of reproduction, meaning that there are some individuals that reproduce, the queen specifically in the case of ants, and, and, and many, many, many individuals that don't reproduce, all the worker daughters. And the question, of course, is, you know, why would you have, uh, the, the paradox would be, why would an individual forego its own reproduction to help others reproduce? Um, and, and there are, uh, uh, this question has been considered for a long time and, 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 and there are various explanations and I won't go into all of them, but I will just tell you how we thought about it. And we thought about it in a way that kind of removed the paradox in the sense that instead of wondering why a daughter isn't um, going away to start her own colony, but is instead staying as a worker to help her mom, we asked what would be um, if, if a mother was able to make some daughters that stay at the nest and, and would be able to make them somehow, you know, possibly deficient in some way so that they actually couldn't even fly away. Maybe they didn't really have good wings or maybe it's some, some sort of mutation that made some of the daughters stay at the nest and help would that be favored by natural selection? So um, because the daughters help their own mother, the, these, these workers don't go out from colony to colony to offer their services to anyone and just say, I will forgo my reproduction to help anyone out there in the world. They just do that for their own mother in their own colony. We thought, well, what if we turn it around and we ask, obviously these daughters are made by their, their, that mother, uh, they, 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 their, her genetic material is shaping their behavior. So what if a mother was able to make some daughters that actually stayed at the nest and help? Would that be favored by natural selection? And so we compare the solitary individual that um, would go around and lay an egg, um, provision it with some food, but then, uh, go away and lay another egg, provision it with some food and so on and so forth, continue to do this process. We compare that against a youth social um, or social lifestyle where a mother would be able to make some fraction of her daughters stay at the colony and help. 
And so with this, when, whenever a daughter is born with a certain probability Q, it stays at the nest and makes the nest get bigger. And with a certain probability, it goes away and it seeds its own colony, much like it happens. Virgin queens go away and start their own colonies, but some fraction of the daughters stay as, as, as workers. And we said, you know, uh, now you have these two different lifestyles uh, and, and, and this process carries on so that, um, you know, eventually you get bigger and bigger groups, but you also seed more and more um, new colonies. And so we said, well, you know, when, whenever this would have happened, this use social mutation or, or set of mutations, these two modes, these two lifestyles would have existed in exactly the same ecological context. They probably still have the same predators. They probably still eat the same thing. There wouldn't have been much time for them to become very different. Um, so we should, we, we can simply write the equations of these two different modes of reproductions, uh, of reproduction and um, ask which one would be able to outcompete the other in competition for uh, resources. So what assumptions do we put into these equations? There have to be some costs and some benefits of sociality. Otherwise, this is a pretty simple set of equations. You just build bigger and bigger uh, groups. So you have to write equations that keep track of groups of different sizes. Um, and so we want to know, depending on what size of a group you are and relative to what you would have been if you were a solitary individual, what are the different costs and benefits that you might be paying or, or receiving? And we thought about that in terms of, especially in terms of focusing on the mom, the, the, the queen, because she is the one who's reproducing. So we thought, how might her reproductive rate be affected and how would her expected lifetime be affected? So if we have, so uh, the, 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 the rationale is the same. So in the interest of time, I'll just focus on the reproductive rate. Um, so uh, on the y-axis, we have the queen reproductive rate. And on the x-axis, I am going to increase the group size. In red, I'm showing the, sorry, let me just, um, right. Um, in, in, in red, I'm going to, oops. Uh, in red, I'm going to show the solitary mother. Um, she, she would have been somewhere on this y-axis. Um, doesn't matter where, we are going to do things relative to that dot. Um, and then what would happen to a, um, to, a, to a social mother that is by herself with her first batch of eggs? So the only difference between these two mothers is that one is just laying eggs here and there and leaving the egg with some food, but moving away, never really staying with her eggs. And the other, the social mother, is one who actually stays there with her first batch of eggs, protects them, waits for them to, to hatch, and then, you know, feeds them and so on and so forth. And eventually, some of the daughters stay at the nest and the groups get, grow bigger and bigger. We would assume that that social mother has a lower reproductive rate to begin with. And that's because she has to use a lot of her energy reserves to actually do all this other stuff. So she doesn't just build a nest. She also has to defend these eggs. She has to clean them of parasites. Um, it's an extremely, extremely costly process. And in fact, queens, even in very advanced colonies, have to um, drop their wings and consume the, the, their own wing muscles to be able to have the energy to carry on with this process of, of, of just rearing her first batch of eggs. So it would make sense at the beginning that she's paying uh, uh, some cost to reproduction, but eventually as she, has a, a, as she becomes part of a social colony, the daughters that stay are going to get more and more um, and, and, and higher and higher numbers. And eventually uh, the, the, the reproductive rate of the queen should increase and, and should surpass that of a solitary mother because event, eventually it will plateau, but it will plateau at a pretty high level because eventually queens in a youth social colony don't do anything other than rear their, their, their other than lay eggs. So basically they just sit on a pile of eggs and the, 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 uh, in the royal chamber, they never go out. They are fed by her, by, by, by the daughters and, and so on and so forth. So um, eventually all of her energy could be put into um, reproduction and she would also have a pretty high uh, lifespan. So at that time, we made this very, very simple model. And we said, if we ask the question this way, what would the answer look like? Would it be easy or not to, um, 
to uh, evolve this social strategy? Of course, th the answer depends a lot on the relative costs and benefits and, 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 and so on, but there was a very, very important takeaway that actually almost kind of got lost in, 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 in all of the discussion around that paper. But the most important takeaway, at least for me, was that no matter how I analyze the model, sociality could evolve. It was really hard. But one of the hardest things that it had to um, overcome was the fact that the benefits of group living had to kick in at very small group sizes. And no matter how I calculated them, these group sizes had to be so small, like single digits. And that seemed, you know, really strange to me because I didn't even have the language to express it at the times. So I didn't really know about complex systems. But basically what this meant is at the beginning, you have a mother and her daughter. So they're genetically very similar. There isn't very much heterogeneity that would produce, you know, maybe you could say, well, some heterogeneity, they all bring in something different and lo and behold, they'll be able to do something different as a group, but they're all genetically similar. They're probably very similar morphologically. Again, they're daughters of the same mom. Um, they're, they're roughly similar in the same age, uh, in, in, in terms of age. So um, how could you possibly get such enormous benefits at really, really, really small group sizes? And, and so to me, it seemed like this was a very, um, you know, very strict prediction. And, and I really would have liked to know a way to test it at the time, but we didn't really have access and it didn't seem to me that it might even be possible to do it. But there was a colleague who kept coming to my talks about this and we kept talking about these results. And, and eventually, several years later, when he set up his own lab at Rockefeller, this is Daniel Kornauer's lab, um, he actually create, he, he, he managed to set up a system in which we would be able to look at individuals that are genetically identical, so clonal ants, um, individuals that are selected to be of the same size, of the same, um, of the same age, and put them together in groups from one individual to many individuals and see what happens with group size. So actually test this. And this is a fairly primitive uh, ant species. It's, it's already used social in nature, but it's not so, uh, uh, it's not so um, uh, committed to so many different aspects of the, of the youth social process that you can't rear it in small groups. So you can actually make groups that survive that are made of two individuals, of four individuals, of six individuals, and so on. So this was really an amazing system. And he could set it up in the lab um, together with, with, with his postdoc, um, Yuko Ulrich, who read this, who, who, who led this study and who, and, and together with graduate students, um, and, and, and see what happens as we increase group size. And so this was now, you know, eight years after the original paper came out, I could not believe that this was actually a, a, a moment where we could look a little bit into what that, into whether that model prediction might, might actually be met. Um, in any case, um, he, we are now going to look at colony growth on the y-axis as a function of group size. And so we can make groups of one, as you might expect, one ant won't do very well, um, two, four, six, and so on, and see what happens to the doubling rate of this colony. So, so what is the actual growth of the growth rate of this colony? So with one ant, it's mostly negative. So that means uh, it mostly just dies. And, and that's to be expected. With two ants, um, it starts to get a little bit better. With four ants, it's better, and so on. And once you get to about six ants, eight ants, you see that you are almost in the same, you are, you are basically approaching one. At 12 and 16 ants, you are at one. And that is the natural doubling rate of this species in the wild. So, so it's, it's relative to that, that's, that's what the one is. So um, in, in, in th this was to me a remarkable result because this meant that indeed somewhere at group size six or eight, so very small numbers, um, something happens that allows the six ants or eight ants to almost harness the whole benefits in terms of growth that they would get from, from living in a very large colony. Um, so my graduate student, Chris Tokita, actually led the, the, uh, the theoretical part of this work. Um, and, and together we found that what is behind this is a rudimentary division of labor. So these ants are starting to be able to divide 
uh, labor as soon as they are at around six or eight, but not when they are two or four. And why do I say rudimentary? And this is another uh, very interesting point because uh, of thinking about things at the origin. If we would think about division of labor based on our definitions of division of labor in ants in, in colonies of 5 million individuals, um, we would have missed what was happening here. What's rudimentary about it is that it's not that this particular ant is going to be a forager and this particular uh, ant is going to be a nurse, but rather what happens is that um, it's, it's their relative, everyone is going to do a bit of everything because with just six to eight ants, no one can really commit to anything. Everything has to kind of get done. Um, so everyone does a little bit of everything. But what becomes conserved over time when you have more than six ants is the relative ranking of individuals. So if I am more of a, of a worker, to, of, a, of a forager today than Fred is, um, then tomorrow I may do a little bit work, less work than I did today, but I'm still going to do more work than Fred is going to do. And he's going to do more nursing than I'm going to do. And, and so, so, so our relative ranking with respect to each other starts to become conserved. So that's why we called it a rudimentary division of labor. Now, I made a theoretical model and, 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 and we're able to recapitulate this with, with it's a simple threshold model, the kind of model that you'd use to model how neurons fire. Um, it's, it's often be, been used to explain division of labor in, in self-organized systems. And um, the nice part about it is that we were able to recapitulate this with, with very minimal assumptions. You don't really need fancy interactions between the ants. You don't really need anything except for minute differences to begin with in their threshold of responding to different, um, to different uh, tasks. Um, but how does this rudimentary, I mean, okay, so this is happening, fine. This is great, this is beautiful, but how does it actually boost fitness? What does it have to do with fitness? Um, so this is where, the, this is also where the mathematical model actually gave us the intuition for what to test experimentally. So Chris was able to see in the experiments that as soon as you start to have six or eight ants, you start to see a more, much more homeostatic system. The ants were changing a lot less between the tasks that they were doing. So you've started to see, and what that translated into was lower and lower task neglect. Basically, the, the, if you measure the fraction of time that a certain task gets unattended to uh, or is left unattended in the colony, that quickly got to zero in, in, the, in the model. And so we were able to, check, uh, to, to test that empirically. And even though it didn't get to zero in, in, in the system, you can clearly see the same um, decreasing trend. So what a rudimentary division of labor does so is that it, 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 it boosts fitness by increasing homeostasis in, 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 in these systems. So to me, this was a, a, an amazingly exciting example of basically theoretical work thinking about the origin of multicellularity that I, uh, and, and, and origin of use sociality that I didn't really think was really testable, right? That's why we need models to think about the origin of these, of these behaviors. There was, we can't really see it happen at the moment. Um, but somehow through some really clever um, experimentation, um, some you know, nearly a decade later, we got a really nice um, insight into what, might, what is possible at the very origin of these groups with, with again, to, to remind you, ants that were genetically identical, uh, morphologically identical, that, 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 that were the same age. So, so everything was kept as similar as possible to make it as boring as it can be. And yet some synergy could arrive out of that, arise out of that. And, and, and that could actually provide this enormous boost in, in, um, um, in fitness that might then lead to the evolution of these uh, complex social behaviors. Now, and I'll go through the next slides um, fairly quickly. How, if you think about, you know, similarly, let's ask questions about diversity. These are just different life cycles here. I love how they all look. So I thought I'd put them there to emphasize diversity, but also because they're so pretty. Um, but these are very simple multicellular organisms. Uh, you'll see dictyostelium, discoidium, slime molds at the bottom. You'll see volvox um, and, and um, you'll see coanoflagellates. But how do you get all these different life cycles, again, out of those very simple operations? And again, we very much think about questions of the origin. 
And so we ask, well, what do we have to work with at the origin? We have the ancestor and often the ancestor in theoretical models, the ancestor is just kind of treated as this little simple circle and then something interesting might happen to it later. But this really simple circle actually has managed to survive and thrive um, before this, whatever happened to it that put it into a group. And so what kind of abilities might this ancestor actually bring to the table once it's part of the group? And so we make these very bottom-up models that actually start with the ancestor. With, we endow the ancestor with some gene regulatory networks that are able to sense the environment. Presumably this ancestor did not live in a completely stable environment, might have had to, for instance, care about uh, diurnal nocturnal shifts or might have to care about seasonal shifts or, 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 or who knows. Um, and so it, we have a gene regulatory network that is able to sense environments, respond to those environments and make certain decisions about what genes to be expressed. And only after that, we allow for the potential to form groups. And then we do some sort of, we started by thinking about staying together first. And so you might have a, a division that, 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 that is imperfect and then cells get stuck together and you start to form bigger and bigger groups. But cells might also, um, that might be uh, due to some sort of promiscuous stickiness that might exist in one of the environments. And so um, the cells might actually be stuck to each other only in, in only when they um, only when they express gene A. This kind of promiscuous, so 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 basically a function of a gene that that a, 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 that is not the function that it was um, evolved for. Um, but accidentally, it just happens that it also is sticky when it expresses that the, that the cell is also sticky when it expresses that particular gene, allows it to stay together. Uh, depending on how sticky they are, they might also, um, some cells might occasionally get lost. Um, but this basically gives the potential for groups to form. And uh, we can also, like we did with the ants, look at possible costs and benefits, for example, escaping predation, um, but also sharing resources with others and therefore possibly having fewer resources if you are in the middle of the group and so on. So you can think about different costs and benefits. The point here is to say that with a very, with, with, with thinking just a little bit more about what the ancestor could bring to the process and then allowing only these very simple operations of building groups and then thinking about, you know, what might be simple benefits and costs, um, you start to, uh, I won't go through all of the details, but basically in this parameter space that depends on how strong your benefits are and, and how sticky um, your, how, how sticky you are when you express gene A, um, you start to get a diversity of life cycles. And I'm very happy to go more into the details if you're, if you're interested in this kind of modeling, but basically we are able to recapitulate life cycles that are quite diverse um, and, and that mirror, you know, in, in, at a very simple level of conceptualizing them, uh, mirror some of the extent life cycles. So if you look, for example, um, at, uh, at life cycle number three, this is basically what happens to animals. They are always sticky, they remain always sticky, and only every once in a while there's an event where a single cell might rupture from the, might, might rupture from the group and, and start its own start growing its own um, uh, its, its own group. But then there are others that like in cycle four, that um, be slowly become groups, stay as groups all throughout environments one and environments two. And at some point when, the, when, the, when you get the shift between environment two and environment one, maybe it's as soon as it becomes at, at, at daybreak, um, they explode and they, they create a lot of propagules that then restart the process. So this would be very similar to, for example, slime molds that um, you know, are, 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 are solitary individuals, but then start to form groups. Um, and then those groups then, uh, then separate again into lots of uh, individual cells. So the point, if we also allow coming together in addition to staying together um, with under the same, otherwise everything stays the same, we get two additional life cycles. And this is all to say, uh, the biggest conclusion of this, because obviously I'm going too, too fast for you to really look at all those parameter regimes. The most important conclusion from this is that um, there's a lot to be harnessed by 
thinking a little bit more about the ancestral conditions, the physiological constraints and the ecological conditions under which the, the, the um, ancestor um, uh, existed right before the potential for multicellularity arose and then allowing for that to happen and then seeing what kind of diversity, emergent diversity one can get out of that. Um, finally, on, on this topic, um, what makes construction robust? And so actually, when I started to think about uh, biology, a lot of uh, that I, I spent most of my, uh, my time originally thinking about the evolution of cooperation. Often when you think about groups and you realize that uh, in order for a group to be robust, to basically not fall apart, um, what you need is for the interests of those cells to somehow be aligned, whatever that means. And, and one way in which one can interpret that is that they somehow have to cooperate, right? So, so they shouldn't cheat on each other. And of course, if you think about staying together, it all starts from a mom, uh, daughter, let's say mom, mother cell and her daughters and so on and so forth. The potential for cheating there is a little bit uh, uh, simplified because the only way you really have a cheater is you have to produce it yourself. So it's cancer. But if you think about, uh, and, and one has to think about, you know, how to, um, how to um, keep that in check, obviously. But when you think about aggregative multicellularity, anything can happen there. Because the point is that unless you are able to somehow exclude free riders, maybe by recognizing your kin or doing some other complicated procedures, um, you're going to be vulnerable to whomever comes into your group. Um, so that always seemed like a, 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 a trickier uh, problem to solve. And, and certainly there are a lot of cooperative mechanisms uh, or, or mechanisms for the maintenance of cooperation that have been uh, proposed. And I worked on some of them. But here's a system that I, that just like, fell in my lap at a conference as I was starting uh, my um, job at Princeton. And this is the system that convinced me to actually do experiments because I was dying to, to actually test the predictions that we made. So these are slime molds. This is Dictyostelium discoidium. It's an absolutely amazing organism. It's a eukaryote, an amoeba that is free living in the soil as long as it has uh, food. And the food is bacteria. Uh, so it's a predator of bacteria. As long as there's food around, it eats, it divides, free living. As soon as food has gone away and they, and they starve, they undergo this amazing aggregation process that leads to um, eventually, so all these cells stream towards the center, they form a little mound. That mound turns into an actual multicellular organism that has an inside-outside uh, boundary. And, 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 and that looks like a slug and the slug crawls around. It does some sort of chemotaxis, phototaxis until it finds the right conditions. And when it does find the right conditions, it creates basically a mushroom. It's called the fruiting body. Um, it's, it's, it, 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 it looks like a mushroom, it forms a stalk that at the top has a globule of spores and those spores are resistant to starvation and they, um, they um, um, can be dispersed. So the interesting, the really interesting part about this organ, I mean, there are so many interesting parts. The collective organization is amazing and has been studied a lot, but, but a very interesting um, point here is that uh, about 20% of the cells that appear in that, that, that aggregate to begin with will eventually become the stock and they'll die to become the stock. So they pay an enormous cost. So if you're one of the cells that's going into the aggregate, you have one in five chances of actually dying. And then the others go up, they form the spores and, and everything is great for them. It's still a big question which if there is a priori a way to know if you're gonna be one of the cells that's going to end up in the stock or, or so, so, so people don't really yet know. We don't, there are some promising avenues, but I don't think it's, it's fully accepted or known, um, or known yet. Um, the other really interesting point is, so not only is it a costly kind of multicellularity, but they don't seem to be very good at kin discrimination. So you will actually get genetically heterogeneous fruiting bodies at the end and not just in the lab, but also in the wild. And the really interesting, and so people have sampled these fruiting bodies in the wild and found these uh, genetic chimeras. And so the point here was that um, 
how does how is this at all robust? How is this not immediately vulnerable to a genotype? They're also extremely diverse in the wild. So if you pick a you know a cubic centimeter of soil, you'll find a ton of different genotypes of, of this dictyostelium discoidium. So um, there's definitely possibility for this kind of heterogeneous mixing to happen. How do you not get the emergence of a cheater? that never goes into the stock, always goes into the spores. And if you, if you have that one, it'll do better and better and better, no matter what kind of uh, protective, uh, you know, unless you're, you're able to discriminate against it, um, it'll eventually take over this whole population and multicellularity would be lost. So I was absolutely fascinated with this and became even more fascinated when I realized, this is one of our videos, but um, it, it's very similar to a video that was shown at this conference. You're going to see the aggregation process, which is absolutely amazing. But instead of focusing on that, which is, you'll see now goes into the left corner, notice something else happening on the plate. A bunch of cells are simply not even aware of the aggregation process. They are staying behind, but, but you know, not responding at all to any of the gradients of cyclic AMP and all the, uh, all the other molecules that are um, important for the aggregation process. So what's up with these guys? And at first, the, the, you know, the response was, well, they're probably broken somehow, or you know, they're either broken, meaning they just can't do the multicellular pro you know, aggregation, they can't, they can't undergo it, or you know, when you have to coordinate millions of cells, it's impossible not to lose a few behind. And, and, and by the way, at the time, people were seeing only very few of these. It's only um, in our, you know, we, we've started to, to look at the process in a way that allows us to look at different genotypes and see that depending on genotype, you are definitely leaving a lot more of these individuals behind and, and depending on the abiotic conditions and so on. The short story is that this turned out not to be broken. There's nothing wrong with them. If you give them food, they'll eat, they'll divide. And when they starve, their progeny are going to be able to recapitulate the multicellular process. And then themselves, they're going to leave behind some loners. Um, they're, they're a heritable strategy, different genotypes. They have different uh, numbers of these loners that they leave behind. Um, they're influenced by abiotic factors, so agar concentration and, and, and all sorts of other things, but also by biotic factors, so what other types are on the plate. So it's a really quite complex story, but I just wanted to show you a very quick data result. Uh, when I first thought that this is a promising and interesting strategy, I thought that it might look like this. Um, the, the first part, when, so, so on the x-axis here is how many cells we start with that are starving. So how many starving cells do I start with and how many loners should I expect? And initially, if these cells are too sparse, they need to do quorum sensing. If they're too sparse, they won't be able to sense each other. So all of the cells are going to stay as loners. So that's not a very interesting part of the process. But my suggestion was that these loners might be like the easiest thing is that they would be some sort of stochastic switch. They just flip a coin and decide who's going to stay as loner and who's going to go. That would be the simplest thing to imagine. Turns out that first part is true. That's the data. Um, the other part is not true. And this is a super exciting result to me uh, because it let us, it's not a stochastic switch. What seems to happen here is that regardless of how many uh, cells you start with, you always have a constant number of loners that are left behind. And I find that to be absolutely fascinating. It was interesting to think modeling wise, how would you get such a result? But I think the, the takeaway from it is that the loners are not making the decision to stay as loners independent of the social process. It is actually an outcome of signaling with everyone else that produces constant numbers. So it's a little bit uh, just a, you know, an imperfect parallel, but it's a little bit like all of us being uh, isolated right now, not because we are all individually and independently deciding that we're loners, but because there has been some sort of societal decision that, that, that we need to be loners, right? So, so they're not loners individually, they're um, they are loners as the, becoming a loner is actually a part of the decision making process um, that 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 requires communication and so on. The interesting thing about these loners, just to wrap up, why I got very excited. I mean, there are many interesting things about them, but what I got very excited about them in terms of the robustness question is that um, the loners could actually 
function as a sort of a seed bank, right? So as, as a reservoir. So if they are not part of the, of the multicellular aggregate, that they, they can't be taken advantage of by a free rider. That's great. But at the same time, if they get food, if the food returns in the environment, they can eat, they can divide, and they can, their progeny can recapitulate the multicellular process. So in some sense, this is quite different from all the types of mechanisms that I was used to thinking about cooperation as in, we need to save every single group. Um, and so I want to understand what kind of mechanisms I can put within the group to save cooperation within every single group. This is more like, well, every single group might die out, but the potential for multicellularity will not because it can stay within these loners that are otherwise out of sync with, with, with the multicellular process. Um, and, and in general, ever since I've started giving this talk, it's become clearer and clearer that in almost every system where we've studied synchronization and collective dynamics, there seems to be a subset of the population that is out of sync with the rest of the system. Whether you think about the great uh, wildebeest migration, most of them, a million and a half, start the migration, do the migration, but about 200,000 stay behind. Um, locusts, same. They all, you have this in, incredible um, coordination of, 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 of locust swarms, but sometimes at the back, locusts peel off and revert to being solitary grasshoppers. Um, it happens with salmon, it happens with masting, you know, flowering in bamboo. It happens in a lot of different systems, basically. And it's just mostly been ignored because we have focused on the amazing coordination because that is an amazing thing to indeed understand. But if the, lo if, if the loners in Dictyostelium are any indication, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a really promising part that, 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 that or, or a promising hypothesis that maybe those loners, these out of sync individuals, the one that don't seem so interesting might actually play a really important role in making the system more robust. So I have, um, and possibly you can think of that in, in human systems as well. I will ask the organizers, I can take five more minutes to just flesh out a little bit this or, or, or I can stop here and take questions. What do you guys prefer that I do? I think we have until one fifteen, right? Quarter past one for the. So you you still have uh, twenty five minutes. We we have a little bit of extra time for for questions for sure. So I would I would say uh, definitely uh, <clears throat> go okay. ahead. Go yeah. ahead, yeah. All right. Well, then the perhaps uh, this. I just wanted to make sure that there's a bit for everyone. So maybe I was overly ambitious, but let's see if we can tell a quick story here. All right. So that was an evolutionary time scale. It's a hard one to study because um, you have. You, uh, when you ask origin questions, you can never really see the origin. So you have to use the modeling, uh, you know, and, 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 and try as much as possible to, to use it as a tool to infer what might have happened, but just kind of challenge it yourself and try to come up with many alternative explanations. Um, here's an ecological timescale problem that, that suffers, um, even though this one we can see and we can touch, um, it's actually pretty hard to study because it happens on enormous scales and therefore experimentation is hard here, not because this is inaccessible, it's right in front of us, but um, it's, it's, it's just enormous and, 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 and perturbing some of these systems uh, would probably not yield anything interesting in, in, you know, in our lifetime, so uh, we would not really be able to study it um, easily. So here, this, these are satellite images. This is Northwestern Tanzania. Uh, what you see as uh, dark spots are, are, are clumps of vegetation that are very, very green, doing very well. In between them, much sparser uh, vegetation, um, if at all, in some regions. But the point is that these really green uh, spots are very, very similar to each other. They have more or less the same diameter. Um, they have... Uh, more or less six equidistant neighbors. You know, of course, it's a natural system, so there will be some variation, some heterogeneity there. But in principle, this looks like a regular pattern. And so does this one. This is uh, also vegetation. Um, this is lab labyrinthine pattern in Niger. Uh, this is now uh, an aerial view of the Namib desert. These are the fairy circles. So it's gaps, uh, so, so soil surrounded by a taller vegetation and then uh, just like a, a what, what looks like a homogeneous cover of vegetation between them. 
And of course, when you look at these, these are the, the amazing thing about some of these patterns is that um, they, they stretch on enormous um, spatial scales. So this one is in Namibia. Maybe each one of these uh, here has about, has between six and eight meters diameter, um, but it, and, and, and they're about 20 meters apart. But um, they, they, you can find it uh, across the, the, the um, coast of Namibia and uh, they stretch all the way from Angola to South Africa. So these are patterns that are, that, that the features themselves are large enough that we can see them from the satellite. Um, but the, um, but, but even more impressively, they are, they spread over hundreds of kilometers and, and um, sometimes thousands of kilometers. So that's pretty, to me, it was insane. When I saw these patterns, I thought, how is this possible? Ecosystem seems so complicated. I had never even thought of thinking about working in an ecosystem because it always seems so complicated. But when you see such simplicity emerge, at least at a certain scale, then you start to wonder, well, maybe this is a good scale at which we should start posing some questions. Maybe some of the rules that leads that lead to such emergent organization um, can give us some insight into uh, at least some of the major players in these systems. So of course, these patterns are not new. Uh, they should have immediately made you think of these um, animal code patterns. And the person who uh, proposed the first model for how this kind of pattern might have arisen without any physical template. So Turing was really obsessed with this question, how could you get this emergent regularity without any physical template that says this is where the black stripe has to go and this is where the white stripe has to go. And he proposed a very simple system, which we refer to as scale dependent feedbacks. Basically, the idea is that you have to have some sort of um, local positive feedback that makes, let's say, a spot grow and grow and grow and grow, but then that st a spot has to stop growing so that uh, you get the in-between spots and then you get the next spot, right? So there has to be something inhibitory at a long distance, so some long distance negative feedback, and then eventually that has to taper off so that the next spot can start and so on. Um, so this was, I think, one of the most elegant models because it's so simple, but sh without it, you wouldn't believe it, right? You have to kind of write down the equations to see that this indeed can produce the patterns. Um, in developmental biology, um, Turing patterns have been sought, you know, ex Turing type explanations have been sought for, for a lot of patterns. It turns out to not be the most successful explanation. There are many, many different mechanisms that can produce such patterns. But Turing remained a tantalizingly simple uh, propo uh, you know, proposition for how, how these systems might be organized. And ecologists, when they started to be aware of these patterns, started to employ a similar scale-dependent feedback framework to try to explain it. And how might that work? Well, if you're in a system with dense soil, if it rains, water pools at the surface, um, eventually it evaporates and it doesn't, not much of it uh, gets into that top layer of soil where plants would be able to use it. If you're in a sandy soil, the opposite happens. It infiltrates too well, gets to huge depths, and again, you don't have enough moisture at that top layer of soil. But if you have a, one plant that somehow manages to establish somewhere, as that plant grows, its roots start to form their own little uh, microsystem there. Uh, that that actually retains moisture and creates a range of facilitation so that if other plants start nearby, they actually do well because they can take advantage of that moisture. However, as this plant's clump gets bigger and bigger and the roots grow bigger and bigger, you're going to eventually hit a range of inhibition because they need to draw more and more water and they're going to draw it um, laterally as well. And so plants that might start nearby aren't going to do well, but plants that start at a distance are going to thrive um, and do the same thing. And so eventually, if you're in a pretty homogeneous system with plants that are roughly the same and with very similar roots, um, then you're going to see um, some sort of periodicity. Um, and that leads to these patterns. And there's a very simple uh, visualization. There's a simple uh, partial differential equation systems that looks at uh, water diffusion and plant dispersal that's modeled as diffusion. And here I'm showing you the output of the model. What happens if you have vegetation biomass on the y-axis, rainfall on the x-axis? We start at high rainfall. 
naturally high biomass, everything looks like a well-watered lawn. As you keep decreasing rainfall, the model predicts a succession of patterns. Um, and it's the succession that goes to gaps first, those gaps, uh, regular gaps first, those gaps get stretched um, and, and become these um, labyrinthine patterns. Then those fingers of, of uh, you know stretch more and more and more and they uh, break the vegetation and you start to form spots and then the model predicts that the that interestingly that spots is the very last pattern that you see and then dramatically the system catastrophically declines to desert and when it does so um basically you've lost all the vegetation from a state where you actually still had quite a bit of vegetation. So this is uh, not great. If you ask what happens if rainfall comes back, the same, the system can recover, um, but, and, and, and will pass through the same succession of patterns, but notice that it requires a lot more water to recover the system than, than, than it did when, when we lost it. So this isn't really great news at all. But there is a silver lining, and that comes from the patterns. If the patterns always happen in exactly the same succession in both directions, then we know that if we are in a spot-like pattern, that ecosystem is in danger of collapse. We don't know when it'll collapse, but we know that small perturbations can move it from here directly to here. If, however, we are in spots, we're, uh, we're, sorry, in gaps of vegetation, we're probably fine. So if you have to divert resources, you could use uh, these patterns as indicators. Now this is all, um, and, 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 and this is really important because these models apply primarily where the mean annual precipitation corresponds to the global drylands, which cover about 30% uh, or 40% of the world's, of the earth's surface and support about 40% of the population. So we would want some sort of indicator that tells us whether things are going to go bad. Now, where I come in, so this is uh, some few decades of work that I just explained, where I come in is that I started to work with collaborators in, in Africa, and we started to look at such spots. And the interesting thing is that we didn't just have the satellite imagery to go after, you know. Um, one of my collaborators was doing work in these systems, um, Rob Pringle, and he said, what do you think forms these spots? And I said, well, I, I don't really know, this is my specialty, but it looks like it could be a curing type pattern. He said, yeah, the interesting thing is that if you go under every one of those spots on the ground, uh, you actually find this, a little hill. And, and these are some deer like antelopes uh, for, for scale. And then, that's not just a regular hill. Each one of those hills is one termite mound. So one termite colony forming one big mound is under every one of those spots, not multiple, one, right? And that immediately starts, you know, starts to get you thinking, could it be that it was the termites who created the pattern first and then the vegetation grew well on top of them or could it be that the vegetation formed self-organized itself in a curing manner and then the, the, the termites uh, all liked these and, and landed on these and thrived and the ones that didn't land on these spots didn't thrive and so on. Now, let's say for a second that it's the termites. <clears throat> Why would vegetation grow so well on termite mounds? Well, it's because termites um, are the most efficient uh, at, uh, at organisms at breaking down um, uh, organic matter. And, and so they uh, break down cellulose, for example, which they get from plant litter and animal dung and all, and all of the other things. And um, they, they bring it back to the nest, they break it down and they release nitrogen and phosphorus, which are great for plants. There's also a lot more moisture associated with termite mounds for various reasons that are fascinating, but I won't get into. But in principle, plants on termite mounds, if the termites allow them to grow on their mounds, which is not a given, but if they do, they have more nutrients and they have more rain or more, more, more moisture. So that should be great. So they should grow really well. And they could look like this if it started with termites being self-organized. Now, how would the termites get self-organized? Turns out that there is a very simple mechanism for that. Here, uh, just a short video to show you what happens to, um, these are termites at the two ends of these, you'll see these vials. Um, we put termites from the same colony. This is just the control 
some workers, some soldiers from the same colony just to see what happens as they, um, as they explore this arena. Um, not very much happens. Um, they'll, you'll see at some point that they just start foraging, they run into each other. The bigger ones are the soldiers. When the soldiers run into each other, they'll stop a little bit, they'll smell each other, they'll assess whether they are of the same colony. And when they know that they are of the same colony, they just go their separate ways and they continue to do what they were doing. Now notice what happens if we put in those two vials, but now it's zoomed in, termites of two different colonies you'll start to see this, this like headbutting happening. That headbutting is soldiers trying to decapitate everyone else. And sure enough, at the end of this video, um, we have a lot of dead um, termites and one surviving very maimed soldier that won't survive much longer. So termites actually fight to the death. They're very territorial. They build their mound, they, they go out circularly, um, so they're central place foragers. They go out to forage for resources, which they then bring, bring back to their mound. If they run into anyone else, they'll start a fight and they'll fight to death. And if you, uh, if, if you have an imbalance of sizes, the bigger colony always wins and continues to expand. But if you have two colonies that are roughly of similar sizes, neither can gain ground. And so you'll have a lot of conflict at the border, but the two colonies that are of basically the same size are going to be able to establish themselves where they are. And so that kind of competition for the resources in these territorial organisms that do this central place foraging can easily lead to this hexagonal pattern because that's the basically the optimal arrangement of these colonies in space to make use of every possible resource um, and available and at the same time um, um, right I will I uh, sorry I realized I went way over now uh, I get too excited about this so anyway the problem is so termites could also look like this is the bottom line how do we know whether is termites or vegetation turns out to be a super interesting question, but we think we have the answer. The question is also, if it's the termites creating these spots and not curing, what's the consequence for ecosystems? Um, I'll come back to this slide if you want me to, but the trick to figure out whether it's termites or not requires that we look at a mesoscale and find an additional mesoscale pattern that had been entirely overlooked in all of the satellite imagery because we can't see it, it's too small. Uh, so it appears uniform. Once you find that, um, it's, it's a pretty good indication that, that, uh, mech that the termites are at play. And the only uh, last takeaway here is to compare the two systems. No mounds is on the left. That's what I was showing you earlier with the catastrophic collapse. And then this bistability, this hysteretic loop that shows that you need more water uh, to recover it. And to the right is what happens with mounds. With mounds, notice that you, we still have a catastrophic collapse to desert eventually, but it's significantly reduced uh, compared to without mounds. And um, you also require a lot less water to revegetate the system, even if at first you only revegetate the mounds and only eventually you're going to revegetate the whole, uh, the whole system. So the, the mounds increase robustness. They act like a buffer and, and, and they also help um, reconstitute the system. And the interesting thing here is then that if you look at a, at a, at a satellite image and you see spots, we have no idea what to say about the robustness of that system. We still very much need to know to go on the ground and understand what are the mechanisms that are underlying because absolutely identical, statistically identical patterns can be produced by very different mechanisms that have very different consequences. And these are important um, so that we can understand what's going on, predict what might happen, but also try to engineer uh, solutions. These are all my collaborators. I thank you all very much for your patience and I'm sorry I, I ended up taking quite so much time now, but hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Uh, should I keep sharing or go back? Uh, to... I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe you'll have to, uh, if you have questions that refer to the uh, to this slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, Matthew, I was gonna offer uh, people to take, to, to ask questions from the audience if you wanna raise your hand. I don't see all participants. I'll try to uh, scroll through. Or if you want to ask questions from the uh, from the chat, I can read them. 
I already had a few colleagues who had to leave to teach, but uh, thanking you for, uh, I quote, a beautiful, beautiful talk. So <laughs> I'll echo that. Uh, and if I want to get people uh, thinking about a question, I had I had one, if I can, uh, I can ask one question. I was, I'm really um, fascinated by the concept of, um, it, maybe it's, it's about optimization, but well, maybe let, let's start with this one. In the first part of your talk, um, you look at this origin. It's a problem of the origin. And it seems to be an optim there's an optimization of the of the tasks, right? So they all the tasks are getting filled or being done. But I was, what is the maybe you looked at that, but it, what is the feedback with the with the task as a dynamic list, right? So the task is context dependent. And as you grow your colony, you have new tasks. Maybe defense was then an issue with two individuals, but all of a sudden you have defense as a task that adds as a colony size. So there's a feedback between what the tasks are and how they can be optimized. Is, is it a yeah, thing? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Yeah, of course. Um, and I, of course. So um, I think um, of, in, in our system, this was very much in the lab. So there wasn't any question, there wasn't any issue of predation. The only real thing, uh, tasks that these, that these ants needed to do is they needed to uh, forage for the various food that was put around the arena for them. They had to take out their trash because they have to maintain their nest and they had to basically attend to their, uh, to the larvae. Mm -hmm. and, and so there weren't very many, mostly they were just like, we called foragers, anyone who had to be outside of the nest or was outside of the nest at any one time. And we called a, a nurse, anyone who was sitting there by the eggs. Um, and occasionally you'd also have ants that, that take a rest. They, they also have to take a rest. Um, but yeah, so I think as, as, uh, as tasks will keep increasing, you'll probably see like a really neat feedback and reorganization. You'll probably see that you might again not have quite enough ants to meet the, the new added task and then you need more ants before you so you you might have dips in your in your in your performance and then uh, carry on and, and so on so that's that's really super interesting oh, cool thanks um so i have a question from uh, lee popovich here um uh, asking to explain a bit more the mesoscale feature that you found in the pattern uh, of the mounds yeah and i'm and i'm happy Whoa. Uh, I'm happy to go back to this. Um, so the mesoscale, so, so basically when I realized that we can't quite tell, how do we tell? I also realized that actually other people had suggested that termites can form patterns. And there was a big debate in the field about, is it vegetation? Is it termites? And in my experience, often when these debates can last decades, uh, it means that everyone is probably a little bit right. And so I wondered what might happen if they were both right. What if it's termites and vegetation at the same, right? Because if someone is clearly wrong, if hypothesis is clearly wrong, then it'll be excluded uh, easily. But if it can persist for decades, then, then something else must be going on, you know? And so, so what if you had both of these acting simultaneously, both of these mechanisms? And so I said, you know, I mean, most of these systems actually, um, it's, it's plants have roots that are much smaller than the scale of a termite mound and the scale of the spot itself. And it doesn't seem like it's competition between plants that can create such a large feature. What if in these systems we have something that we have uh, plants and we have self-organization happening on a template that's given by termite mounds. And so let's run this model, this like paired model and, and, and just see what happens. And that suggested that there should be a pattern with a scale uh, with a wavelength, at least in the system where we were parametrizing the model with a wavelength of about 20 centimeters, right? And, and I thought about it and I was like, sure enough, I would have noticed that pattern. You wouldn't notice it from the satellite. So I understand why it would look like a homogeneous mass from there, but I've walked in these systems. Why have I not seen it? Um, it turns out the savanna is like the prairie, right? It's very tall grasses. So you never really see if there's patchiness on such small scale underneath. And so we were really lucky that we got into an area in a system that where, where fire isn't the pl uh, player, they are usually not, not like really preventing fire. There was one experimental plot that people had burned for the first time and you could actually see the soil and the grass. And all of a sudden the pattern became remarkably clear and we could take photos and analyze it and, and show that it was exactly the same pattern that we were predicting from this joint model. So this like mesoscale pattern basically said there must be two mechanisms, a, scale, a Turing type mechanism Operate, operates at one scale. So it can't produce patterns at two scales. And so then that suggested that, you know, the combination of these two could certainly uh, produce the two, uh, the two patterns. Yeah, okay. 
Interesting. And, and sorry, this was just the photos, uh, just to oh, show yeah. you model results and then the photos from and, and a Fourier transform analysis um, to, to basically compare them. Cool. Thanks. Um, maybe, so I don't, I don't want to manage the time for a session. Do we have time for another question, Celia? We're still good for a... Yeah, I, I think we can take a, a couple more minutes. I know people will have to go, but let's let's take a, one or two more questions and then and then we'll we'll move on. Okay, so we had a question from Leon Glass. If you want to unmute yourself, so the, that was that was fascinating. I have lots of questions, but I'll just ask one. Uh, an, an alternative to the Turing mechanism to the kinds of regulus uh, dotty type patterns can be uh, random seeding plus spreading inhibitory fields. And I wonder if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. mechanism. It was initially proposed by two chemists named Johnson and Mayo, and I rediscovered it many years afterwards. All this goes back a long time. But are you familiar with those types of models and have you considered them? Uh, so basically, it's you're saying not just positive, uh, not um, inhibitory uh, processes alone could create such a pattern. Well, no. So there's the init initiation can be random. random. Yes, absolutely. Then, then uh, there's an inhibitory field that grows out. Yes. Which prevents initiation in a growing field. Yes. And you generate patterns which can be similar to the ones that you're showing. Absolutely. I, I am actually familiar. I did not know that uh, who proposed it, I, I have to admit, but uh, I, you're very much in plants. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, seeding is random. And then often plants, um, there's this like self thinning process that you, uh, so, so strong competition from, from a plant, you know, from a tree that's growing nicely can lead to self thinning. Other, other plants will die. So just inhibitory, like the production of an inhibitory, uh, field as, as you called it, uh, could, could lead. And, and, and we've, we actually just wrote recently a review paper basically saying that even if it's just vegetation self-organizing, we shouldn't immediately think curing. We should also include this uh, purely inhibitory. So that's a great, but I should look more into the history of it. I'll send you some references. Thank, Thank you. That would be wonderful. Cool. Thanks, Leon. Um, maybe a, a last one comes from uh, Anna. Um, PhD student, uh, do you, um, so, that, so that these patterns have been, these stirring patterns have been mapped and described in um, um, desert vegetation and savannas. So do we observe similar patterns in other types of systems and temperate and tropical systems? Um, oh yes, <laughs> yes, actually uh, in a lot of different systems you can observe, you can observe them in the tundra, you can observe them in the, and, and, and ice plays a really interesting role in, 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 our, in Arctic um, uh, patterns and so on. Uh, you can observe them in, in rainforests, but in rainforests, everything is such a mess, such a crowded mess. <laughs> that it's very, very hard to keep track of them. So I think people have actually, you know, you can go and, and uh, you know, for example, arboreal termite nests and, and mark them and you could presumably still create the pattern. It's just that it's so much harder to see anything in, in the rainforest that you have to do a lot of you know, fine combing work on the ground and, and that, you know, create, but uh, people have seen with these like LIDAR uh, imaging and so on, you can actually see if there are, if there are actual mounds, even if they're covered by dense forest, you can still find them because you can find the, the uh, topography, you can map the topography and then we can still analyze patterns there. We've found them in North America with ants, with, with harvester ants and, and so on. So yeah, you can, you can really, anywhere where there hasn't been human disturbance on really large scales, you can still find them. Um, you know, you, you, they need space to self-organize and so you won't find them, you know, in, 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 in Europe um, that easily. But you also find them in, you know, with city organization, which is yet another fascinating question. Um, uh, there, there's whether these patterns arise are, and can also be man-made. There's a big difference between man-made and self-organized natural patterns. Um, different signatures. Man, uh, humans, we tend to organize things in 90 degrees. We really, really like 90 degrees. So if we can actually plan things from the beginning, it arises, you know, we make grids. 
Um, whereas nature seems to like 60 degrees and you have this hexagonal patterning arise uh, very, very often. But sometimes we'll find cities that are organized in hexagonal patterns. And there is a whole really interesting aspect there of the history and, and, and what the patterns tell, tell us about the history. Thanks. Okay, so I'll uh, give, give it back to uh, Cecilia to uh, organize us for the rest. And thank, yes, you again, thank you again, Karina, for that talk. This was a great talk, fascinating. Apologies yeah. that it took so uh, I was, uh, I really we wanted we enjoyed to it. have more every time, second. but I, yes. We enjoyed every second and uh, yes, no, don't apologize. This was just wonderful, um, really uh, lots of uh, interesting ideas to think about for the future, lots of different areas of application, uh, lots of opportunities to think about modeling. Thank you. And I, I do want to say that if anyone has burning questions left after this, please feel free to email me and I'll be more than happy to, to, to continue the conversation. Oh, thank you. I would just like to say that um, these students are now going to meet with, with Dr. Tarnita on a different Zoom link. Um, and after that, we have a um, some student presentations this afternoon for the QLS Research Day. And all members of QLS should have received all the many Zoom links that are involved. But if anybody is attending this seminar today who is who would like to attend the QLS Research Day, please just send me an email or send our coordinator an email, um, coordinator.qls, Alex Dees, and we will send you those links. Um, let me make sure that Karina has the link for the next Zoom session. I don't actually, I think I only got one link, of I, right. but I haven't checked my email in the why okay. this. So I'm going, to, I'm going to send you that right away. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, it's in your inbox, Karina. It's. Um, you you, it's you just sent it? No. I s it's coming again right now. Hmm. Um, so I, I thought I only got the one link, but I might have, which I pressed on today. But uh, That's okay. I'm sending the other one right now. And so I would like to, again, express our thanks. Um, and... Um, I hope that you can join us for some of the rest of the day and um, we will see you. The seminar will be another seminar next week and hope to see you again there. So thank you all. Thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for all the great questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Karina. That was fascinating. I'll let you uh, join uh, the, the other uh, Zoom. Yeah, uh, it'll actually take me uh, just a couple of minutes, of course, to, to turn off this Zoom and to start the other Zoom, okay? I am. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.